What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, we're continuing with the story of our faith. Today, we're in chapter 7. We're talking about the church. Now, we all know from our youth growing up, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people. And of course, I am the church, you are the church, you know. We all know the song, right? So, <laughs> that's basically it. End the video there, Ryan, that's it. Look, the church is not a building, the church uh, is not any tradition of man, the church is not rites or rituals. The church is the people of God. But I think, and, and the, the Lutheran church fathers thought it was important in their day to define what the church was. Because what people thought of the church, what the church had been saying of herself in the 16th century, is kind of markedly different from what the church actually is. So, as we continue in this story of our faith, understanding that there is a God and we are not him, that we are by nature sinful and unclean, inclined towards sin, that God has sent his son into the world to redeem the world, that we are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone, and that he has called men into the ministry to bring this word of salvation to us, and from the preaching of this word, from the gospel, by nature flows out of us a new obedience and good works. What's next? Well, the, the, uh, the congregation, the gathering of the people, where is this man that preaches this message to us? Where, where can we find this God? Where can we access these gifts and this salvation? That is the church. So let's do a little bit of reading and we'll talk a little bit more about the church. Article 7. Our churches teach that one holy church is to remain forever. The church is the congregation of saints, Psalm 149, verse 1, in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. For the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. As Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Ephesians 4, 5 through 6. And Article 8 is going to go a little bit more into the church, but let's talk about this article. This article, it's kind of the Magna Carta of the Lutheran Church. And I get that non-Lutherans watch this channel, and if you do, I would still encourage you to like, subscribe, leave comments, share videos, do all of that, especially if you're not Lutheran, because if you're Protestant, the, this, the, this, this Augsburg confession that we've been going through in this story of our faith is vitally important to even the Protestant. I think lack of understanding of church history hinders Protestants in, in understanding kind of what's been going on with the Roman Catholic Church over the past 500 years, and and why are Lutherans this kind of weird anomaly in Protestantism? And, and it really, an understanding of church history, I think, would redeem mainline American Protestants, that pop culture of evangelicalism that is destroying itself. But, so what are we left with? I mean, this, this Reformation was obviously a schism. It was obviously a, you know, um, and the Roman Catholic Church kind of thinks of us as schismatics. I'm like, well, you're the ones that broke with the Eastern Orthodox Church first, so who's the real schismatic? And now, after this Reformation, we have, I don't even know how many denominations we have, but the, the Lutheran Church rightly confesses that there is one true Christian church on Earth. And that Christian church is not tied to a specific denomination. That church, the church of Christ, is established on earth where the gospel is rightly preached 
and where the sacraments are rightly administered. Now, whatever rituals or traditions or ceremonies that surround this gospel and surround this administration of the sacraments, we can talk about that. It doesn't have to be the same everywhere. When I go, I know for a fact, uh, because sometimes I go to the church attached to my son's school, and sometimes I go to my, my home church, and even, even the church from when I lived uh, elsewhere before I moved back to my hometown, it's not the same everywhere, and that's okay. But in all three of these places, the gospel is rightly preached. And the sacraments are rightly administered. Now, what do we mean? This is important. What does it mean that the gospel is rightly taught? It means that it's about Jesus for you and not you for Jesus. The gospel is a promise to be believed. It is not a work that you have to do. Hearkening back to justification. We're justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. There's nothing that we do, nothing that we contribute. Our works avail us nothing. So the gospel is not a work that we need to do. It's not the law that says do this and it's never done. It is the promise, believe this, and because of Jesus Christ, everything, everything is done already. If, if, if The Bible talks all the time about works and good works and that we should walk in them, but it also clearly defines that the work of God is to believe in his son. That is the one true good work that we are called to from that one good work that God gives to us when he sends his Holy Spirit through the pastor, through the preached word from the scriptures to make alive our dead cold heart and restore us and bring us to penitent faith in Jesus Christ. He also gives us then the other good works that we do, that we go out into the world and serve our neighbor in love. That's the gospel. It is a promise that we believe. So where it's taught strictly as promise, there is the true church on earth, regardless of denominational lines, be it Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, or whatever version 5.986.0 that non-denominationalism is on. The sacraments are rightly administered. Now, we're going to get into the sacraments in the story of our faith, but for now, we're just going to simply define them as baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper. Now, it's, it's some, some of you that are Lutherans, you're be, hey, 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 Lutherans only have two sacraments. Well, I'll meet you halfway. We have two and a half sacraments. We have the sacrament of baptism, where we are buried with Christ into his death by baptism, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. We have confession, where we confess to the pastor and receive from the pastor the absolution of Christ, from Christ himself. But this is it a sacrament? Well, it lacks a physical element, although one could argue the pastor is the physical element. But it's a half, Lutherans, we call it a half sacrament. And then we have the Lord's Supper, the real, true body and blood of Christ, present, truly present, in, with, under the bread and the wine, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Actually, that was Paul that said that. <laughs> um, so, yes, the, the administration of the sacraments, the baptism, this is how we are brought into the church, that when our consciences are burdened, we can confess to our under-shepherd, and he speaks with the authority of the great shepherd that we are forgiven. And we go to the altar still doubting, and we receive here, uh, here, taste and see, the Lord is good. Take this and eat it. This is his body given for you. Take this and drink it. This is his blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So where these sacraments are rightly administered, regardless of denominational lines, it is enough. There exists the true church on earth. Our, from our perspective, the church is broken and, and shattered and, and schisms have rent us asunder. Christ sees us as one unified body because he has declared us to be so. Because the church is not the building, the church is not the steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people 
I'm the church. You're the church. Together, we are the church. And when we gather as the people of God in a place, be it wherever, in America, we're fortunate enough to have church buildings on almost every street corner. When we gather in this place set apart for the holy things of God and we hear his pure gospel and we receive his pure sacraments, there is the one true Christian church on earth. And this really truly is, as I've always said in every video, a confession worth dying for, especially when we consider the time that this was written, where the, the invasion of the Turk and and, and, and the peasants' war, and, and, and this was a life or death thing that happened at the Reformation, and people in the ancient church being slaughtered for their faith, and someday soon the Bible promises persecution will come very, very greatly. And are we going, what are we going to do then? It's a question I've been asked. What are we going to do, especially us Lutherans in our doctrine of closed communion? What are we going to do when we're persecuted, when we're underground? What are we going to do? We're going to confess, make the good confession, that where the gospel is rightly proclaimed and where the sacraments are rightly administered, there, regardless of denominational lines, is the one true Christian church on earth. This was important to the reformers because they were being told as a branch off, you are no longer the church, you are outside of salvation. And they said, hey, it's not outside of the Holy Roman Church that there is no salvation. It is outside of Christ and his church that there is no salvation because the church is the place where the gifts of God are given to the people. That is a brief explanation of what the church is. And in, in uh, chapter 8, we're going to dive deeper into what is the church. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.